Hello and uh, welcome to lab four. This is resting cardiovascular measurements. Uh, what we're going to do today is learn how to take uh, heart rate and blood pressure in three body positions, supine, seated, and standing, and observe um, if there are, are any changes in those numbers as the subject moves in the body positions and then kind of explain why those changes uh, might occur. Before we actually take any measurements, I wanted to introduce the, uh, the sphygmomanometer, uh, that's one of the most favorite words in all of exercise physiology and health, um, more commonly known as a blood pressure device. Um, you will need a stethoscope when you use this as well. Um, so I'm gonna sort of just go through the basic procedure of how to use this device first without the subject and then we'll bring Lindsay in and start actually taking some measurements. So um, as you'll see, your, your hands are gonna be busy when you're doing this. So I like to first just take the stethoscope uh, I'm going to go ahead and just put it around my neck so it's there. Uh, so when I need to use it, I can just use one hand and put the earpieces in. Okay. I do want to point out that um, the earpieces are often angled in one direction. So notice that they're angled forward slightly. When you put this on, you want to have the earpieces angled towards your face. Um, the reason for that is because most people's ear canals are angled that way slightly. So if you put the earpieces in that way, you'll be able to hear better. <clears throat> and hearing really is one of the hardest things with blood pressure assessment. You're going to be listening for what sounds like a pulse, uh, and the, the better you can hear, the more accurate your blood pressure assessment skills will be. Okay? And we also want to make sure that the, some stethoscopes have a large and a small bell, and the small bell is for me measuring blood pressure or heart rate on infants. Um, in this case, there's only one bell, so I don't have to worry about that. If there was two bells, I would want to make sure it's twisted one way or the other, in my, my large side, I would tap on it, make sure I could hear the noise, and then I would know I could hear the, the sounds appropriately, okay? So, um, this is known as the cuff. So cuffs typically come in three sizes, uh, a child, adult, uh, and a large adult. Notice that this one is labeled as an adult size, okay? Um, basically, the, the reason there are different sizes is because you wanna make sure the bladder of the cuff covers at least 80% of the arm. So even though this is very long, the bladder, what, what is actually going to pump up with air is only this long. Okay, so I want to make sure that the bladder, again, covers 80% of my subject's arm when I put it on. Um, if I have a larger individual, we would use a larger cuff. Um, and in our lab, our larger cuffs are red in color, so that's a pretty easy way to uh, differentiate them. Okay, um, another thing to note here is there's an artery mark. And on this particular cuff, the artery mark is on both sides. And notice on this cuff, it says this side goes against the limb. So when I'm placing the cuff, I'm going to line up my artery mark with the brachial artery and make sure that the side that says place against the limb is against the skin of the individual, okay? Now I mentioned the artery. Uh, what we're gonna do is, is locate the brachial artery of the subject. Um, there are several different ways you could do this. You could do that through auscultation using the stethoscope. So you would find the brachial artery, listen for a heartbeat that's found there. To be honest with you, it's kind of difficult to hear a heartbeat there um, often. Another way to find it is just to look to see if somebody has very superficial veins like I do. Usually you can see that big vein that comes right at the crease of the elbow and the brachial artery is often right below that, okay? So a couple different ways you can find the brachial artery. And again, you wanna make sure that this mark is lined up over it. That mark is in the center of the bladder. If this mark is off the artery, that can also decrease the ability to hear the blood pressure um, easily, <clears throat> thus making the assessment much more difficult, okay? So once I get the cuff placed, I'm then gonna pump with my right hand here. So notice that there is a valve. I wanna have the valve pointing up so I can manipulate the valve with my thumb and forefinger in my right hand. Once I get the cuff placed on the subject, what I would do is close the valve. So I'm gonna turn this clockwise. Again, I don't wanna over tighten it, just barely tighten it. And then I would pump with these fingers and the palm of my hand, okay? Once I get it up to where I want it to be, I then immediately open the valve very slowly. The opening and closing of the valve is another skill that really is required to practice pretty often. Once you get a feel for it, it becomes easier to um, <clears throat> assess the blood pressure more accurately. Okay, a couple key um, errors that students often make is they'll use the off hand to tighten this valve. Well, once you start taking the blood pressure, this hand's gonna be busy and it's then harder or more difficult to open the valve with these two fingers. So we wanna close with these two fingers, open with these two fingers as well. Um, what we often aim to do is pump up the pressure at the beginning 
20 to 30 millimeters of mercury above the anticipated blood pressure or around 150 millimeters of mercury for the average person, okay? So I would close the valve, pump this up to around 150 to 160. Then I'm gonna immediately open the valve and let it drop very, very slowly. The speed the needle drops is also a very key thing. If you go too fast, you're gonna miss the beats, okay? If you go too slow, you're gonna create a lot of discomfort for your subject, which you want to avoid as well. So the speed that the needle drops is another thing that is, again, um, developed through practice often, and it takes you a few times to get the hang of it, okay? Um, now, we haven't shown what we do with the stethoscope yet. I'll just show that when we do the assessment on our subject. But what I would do is once I get the cuff placed, before I pump up, I would then put the stethoscope in, have this in my left hand, pump with my right hand. Okay, so that's kind of the crash course in blood pressure. Let's now bring in our subject. So we have uh, Lindsay. What we're gonna do is go through the, the three body positions. I'm gonna actually have you start with a supine, okay? So we'll have her lay on her back on the exam table. And for the supine cardiovascular assessment, we are going to start with heart rate. And on the lab, you're asked to take a 60 second heart rate, okay? For the heart rate palpation, palpation, sorry, we are going to use uh, the radial artery, which you probably remember from lecture is going to be found right at the base of the thumb. I'm gonna use my index and middle finger, apply light pressure at the radial artery. I'm gonna count the number of beats that I feel in the designated time period. In this case, we're gonna go for 60 seconds, okay? So I'm gonna start a stopwatch to keep my time while I count the beats. This is gonna be a slow process again because I'm gonna do this for 60 seconds, so bear with me as we get her supine resting heart rate. So I'm gonna just externally rotate her arm slightly. I'm going to find that pulse. Okay, locate it. Now I'm gonna start my watch. As soon as I start the watch, I'll begin to count silently in my head of her heartbeats. Count the 65 beats, so her supine heart rate using the 60 second palpation method was 65 beats per minute. Remember the unit for expressing heart rate is BPM, otherwise known as beats per minute. Okay. All right, so now we will go ahead and measure her blood pressure in the supine position. So a key thing with blood pressure is we always want to make sure the, the subject's arm is supported either by the device they're lying or sitting on or by you. I'll kind of show you the different ways we can do that. Since Lindsay is laying on an exam table and there is plenty of space, I can just have her extend her right arm out and rest it on the table. Okay. We want to make sure the arm is supported at heart level. Since she is laying supine, that's a perfect uh, thing to do. Typically, as with most other measurements, you're gonna measure everything on the right side of the body. So I'm gonna, on Lindsay's right side here. Move my cuff into position. You wanna make sure it's positioned where you can see it, right? You, you don't wanna have the device facing this way because when I'm taking the blood pressure, I won't be able to see the dial. So you wanna make sure it is facing you. Cuff is deflated currently, okay? I'm going to palpate for Lindsay's uh, brachial artery. Usually it is, you know, slightly on the medial side of the arm, just, a, just uh, below the bicep, but above the crease of the elbow, okay? So I'm gonna have a rest that while I 
<clears throat> place the cuff on. So what I like to do is try to pin that mark right where the artery was. And I'm gonna hold that there. I'm gonna wrap the short side around first, then wrap my long side around using the Velcro. Once I get it where I want it, I'm gonna have a rest again. I'll notice there's a little bit of overlap there and that's okay, that just allows for you know, different arm sizes. It looks like when I did that, the, the, the cuff moved slightly, so I'm gonna just loosen it just a bit, shift it around slightly to get it back over the artery. Okay. Now notice that the cuff edge is one to two centimeters above the crease of her elbow. That's where we want that, okay? And again, this is the center of the cuff. We want the center of the cuff to be right over the artery, so when we pump it up, that artery is completely closed off, okay? So our cuff is in position. Valve in the right hand, fingers, index, and thumb ready to use the valve. I'm gonna go ahead and put the stethoscope ear pieces in now using my left hand. I'm then gonna use my left middle and index finger, placing the stethoscope directly on the brachial artery, flush against the skin. I'm gonna use my thumb to create sort of a clamp to keep that in position. I'm gonna keep the tubes away from the stethoscope head, bell. Once everything is in position, close the valve, pump it up. To 160, immediately open it. Nice slow drop, listening for heartbeats. So there's the first one, 118. And here's a steady heartbeat now. I'm gonna listen for the last beat. All right, so then I'm, once I, the beat disappears, I'm gonna open the valve all the way up, take my stethoscope out, and go ahead and remove the cuff right away. How about that, Lindsay, okay? Okay, so what I was listening for um, was the first instance of sound. So I'm watching the dial. The first sound I heard occurred when the needle was at the 118 mark, okay? So that represents my uh, systolic blood pressure. So for my blood pressure, I'm gonna write 118 down. Again, the first sound you hear, that's the systolic blood pressure. I then heard a rhythmic, steady, heartbeat as the needle continue to drop, okay? Um, the sound quality is gonna vary. Um, it often gets a little bit louder as it gets closer to 100, and then it starts to get a little bit quieter as it continues to goes down, um, go down in pressure. And the last sound I heard was actually at 60. So where the last sound is, that's gonna be your, your diastolic blood pressure. So again, that was about right here, okay? So I wrote down for her supine blood pressure, 118 over 60, okay? What you all will need to do for the, the lab is calculate her mean arterial pressure. The equation for doing that is listed right here. So you'll take two thirds of her diastolic, one third of her systolic, add those together to get a single number. Uh, and again, the unit for this is millimeters of mercury. You would write that for both. Um, I did forget to ask Lindsay her age. What's your age, Lindsay? 25. 25. All right, so we have our supine numbers. Now we're gonna do a seated cardiovascular assessment on her. So what I'll have her do actually is move to uh, the chair. <clears throat> so for this particular one, we're going to take a 30 second heart rate. Okay, what we would then do to convert it to beats per minute is take the number of beats that we count, 30 seconds, multiply it by two to express it in beats per minute, okay? So, again, I'm gonna use a stopwatch. Um, you just need to have a clock or something to look at because you can't count time and heartbeats at the same time, right? So I'm gonna watch a watch, count the beats in my head. I'm, I'm again going to use the radial artery. I'm gonna support her arm, again, at heart level. Just kinda let her wrist rest on my arm. Find that pulse again. Start my watch and count the beats.
So I counted 25 beats in 30 seconds, which would multiply by two, that would give us 50 beats per minute. So her heart rate went down a little bit from supine to seated. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that, that uh, pattern here momentarily. So I have her seated now. Um, again, I'm gonna go ahead and now measure her blood pressure from the seated position. I'm gonna stay on her right side again. Now notice now her arm is, is not supported on the table. So there's a couple options I could have. Um, if she was on the other side of the exam table, I could have her just sort of rest her arm here. Okay, that way it's still supported at heart level, but since she's on this side of the table, I'm gonna manually support her, her, her arm myself. So I'll show you how to do that here in just a second. I'm gonna position my cuff again. It's always good to make sure these, these tubes are all untwisted before you put the cuff on the individual. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and just take Lindsay's arm and sort of clamp her wrist between my upper arm and my torso. Now it's supported to heart level. I can just keep it there. I'm gonna line up my artery mark again. You don't have to get this super tight when you're putting it on. You just wanna make sure it doesn't fall off. Okay, so that's placed correctly. Stethoscope. Again, I'm gonna make sure I can see the dial. Uh, so that time I got 108 over 62. So systolic was a little bit lower, diastolic was a little bit higher. Um, her blood pressure is still, you know, very easy to hear. Um, you're going to be in a situation where some people are going to have loud blood pressures, others are going to have more quiet ones. It's kind of just based upon a lot of factors regarding the individual. Um, somebody who's very much physically active, usually their blood pressure is going to be easier to hear than somebody who is sedentary or has a lot of uh, excess body fat, uh, et cetera, okay? So once we have her blood pressure measured, again, you'll calculate the mean arterial pressure by plugging these numbers into the equation here and putting your mean pressure below, okay? Just looking at how similar these numbers are, your mean arterial pressures will probably be pretty similar um, as well, okay? Now, one other thing I thought of and wanted to show you all um, regarding the stethoscope. When you're placing the stethoscope, you want to make sure it's as flat against the skin as possible. If I have the stethoscope angled like this, or not completely flat against the person's skin, noise from the room is going to come in and I'm going to hear that and that can make it harder for me to determine what I'm actually listening for and is it the actual blood pressure. So you want to make sure the stethoscope bell is completely flush against the skin. I'm applying light pressure, but not too much to keep that nice and level and flat against the skin. That'll just make it easier to hear, okay? Hearing it is one of the biggest challenges. You want to give yourself every advantage possible, so that's one thing you can do to make sure you can hear it adequately. Okay? All right, so one more thing we'll do is the standing pressures now. So we'll go ahead and add Lindsay stand. I'll just get the chair out of the way. Well, for this particular one, we're going to do um, a 15 second heart rate. This is going to give us a little bit more of an instantaneous idea of what a heart rate is. Usually if somebody is exercising and you want to get an instantaneous number, you're going to use the shorter time intervals to assess the heart rate. When they're resting, the longer 30, 60 seconds are appropriate. But during exercising situations, the 15 second count would be good. Um, we'll count the number of beats we feel in 15 seconds. We'll multiply that by four to get our number in beats per minute. So I'm going to grab my stopwatch. And again, we'll support her arm. Find the pulse, and start the clock. Okay, got 
20. 20 times 4 is 80. So our standing heart rate was 80 beats per minute. Jumped up quite a bit from the, the seated, which is not to be unexpected, to be honest with you. Okay? Um, what we typically will see, now this doesn't always happen, and it hasn't necessarily happened with Lindsay either, but these numbers should increase as we move from supine to seated to standing. Heart has to work harder to return blood back up to the thoracic cavity in the head when somebody's in a standing position. Gravity is pulling the blood flow down, so the heart is gonna have to work harder, beat faster, increase pressure, so that should drive the numbers up as somebody goes from supine to seated to standing. When somebody's supine, gravity does not have as much of an effect, so the heart doesn't have to beat as fast, and there is less pressure in the system um, because it's easier to get blood back up to the heart and the thoracic cavity. Now again, that does not always happen. That's kind of what would happen in a perfect, perfect world. Has not necessarily happened here with Lindsay, um, but when you're answering the questions on the lab and on the exam, I want you to tell me what we expect to happen as somebody moves from these three body positions. Okay, so let's go ahead and get Lindsay's last measurement. We're gonna get her standing blood pressure now. Um, so again, I'm gonna go on the right side. And I'll support her arm in a very similar fashion that we did with the last assessment. So I'll just clamp it between my torso and upper arm, place my cuff, make sure that artery mark, artery mark is lined up well. Okay. Put my stethoscope in my ears. Place my bell, make sure it's nice and flat, clamp it with my thumb, and we'll pump up the cuff. Okay, that time I got 104 over 64. Thank you. So 104 was our systolic, 64 was our diastolic, and again, that's in millimeters of mercury. Uh, so just looking at her trends, sort of the opposite of what we might expect. Hers actually went down as we went from supine seated to standing. Um, as a fit individual that Lindsay is, it's, it's more likely these are to be pretty consistent, okay? I think hers was the highest here, maybe because it was the first time that we took the blood pressure. She might have been a little bit nervous. Um, she was more relaxed for these two, so the pressures were a little bit lower. Um, heart rate, you know, this one here is kind of an outlier. Again, it's typical for the lowest heart rate here, highest heart rate here. This one was more of an outlier, and I can't really explain that. It's just, the, it's just what happens when you're, when you're measuring um, cardiovascular variables on individuals, okay? So finish this up by calculating your mean arterial pressure for the standing using this equation above here, and we'll answer the questions. Uh, if you have any questions about the lab or anything at all, again, feel free to uh, email me, and we can talk about it. Thank you.